Hi, everybody. My name is Corinne Tobias. I'm the program director of the Cannabis Coaching Institute. Tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about growing with Alexis Burnett. This whole kit and caboodle is brought to you by the Cannabis Coaching Institute. And we have some new exciting things happening over there, right? We have um, just released our certified cannabis educator program, re-released it with some incredible updates that um, we're really, really excited about. Yeah, we're really focused on giving you the skills and the tools and the confidence that you need to be able to talk and write about cannabis and get paid for it in a variety of different ways. So we have packaged everything that we've learned about doing this exact topic into our class. And when you come out, you have all these different ways to change lives, change the narrative around cannabis and make money. One of the pathways is writing and we have cannabis authors here. So that seems apropos. You also get a fully designed professional website in this program, which is instrumental in getting out there. If, if writing about cannabis isn't your thing, we teach you how to, how to do cannabis retreats, for example, or to do a cannabis podcast like this, right? You could do an awesome cannabis podcast. So we're enrolling for that program. Now you can check it out at cannabiscoachinginstitute.com and we would love to see you. We'd love to see you in here. So welcome, Alexis. Thank you so much for being here. Can you introduce yourself and tell us why growing cannabis is important to you? Sure. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks, Corinne. Um, I appreciate you having me here. My name is Alexis Burnett. I actually just got a haircut and I shaved all the, the hair off my face. <laughs> so, um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, maybe a little bit on my background is this is something I used to actually do every, every year at this time when it was time to start growing. Um, or at least to start to bring your plants outside and to start um, doing outdoor growing in the old days of, of uh, prohibition. Um, I like I'd always grow my hair long to keep me warm in these Canadian winters <laughs> and sometimes some hair on my face. And then uh, I would shave it because I always wanted to look as straight edge as I could. Um, and uh, at this time of year, and, and that was just like life, you know, for 20 20 some years, um, 25 years really, or 20, 20 ish, um, to do that. And that was just my thing. Some people didn't do that if they had big dreadlocks or whatever, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to have all the odds stacked in my favor because this beautiful plant that we all love cannabis was, uh, was illegal and, you know, frowned upon and all those, those things. And, uh, I, I didn't want to go to jail. My journey with cannabis started really, I guess, probably when I was about 16 years old, I had an older brother, um, that was uh, starting to grow cannabis. And then I met some old timers and, and really from the age of probably 16 or 18, I, I've grown every year since. And then uh, fast forward to 2018, when our prime minister told us that it was okay and ethically uh, okay to, to use cannabis. The country legalized it. And at that time, being a teacher and a mentor for so many years, I just was like, you know, I'd love to actually... Um, start to share my knowledge and, and love and passion for this plant. The rest is kind of history in a way. I just want to see people have a good experience with cannabis. And that's, um, and I want to see people grow their own because I, I really do believe the best medicine you can take is the medicine you grow and make yourself. Um, because to me, that's all part of the healing journey. You brought up a lot of really good points. Some things I want to touch on is that you've been in this space for a lot longer than a lot of people here and you did sacrifice and um, had to go through many trials and tribulations in order to grow the plant that many of us grow kind of without thinking about it too much. So I want to appreciate where you're coming from um, with that. Yeah. For everyone in here right now, please feel free to just raise your digital hand or your real hand if you have any questions for Alexis. We do have a few that came in on our form beforehand. So um, maybe we'll start with one of those. This one, uh, Corinne and I were just talking about this one this morning, actually. Um, what are your thoughts on auto flower cannabis um, plants? It, they used to be like the joke of the cannabis industry, it seemed to me. And, you know, it was, a, it was hilarious if you're going to grow them. And now I see way more people talking about it. So can you talk to me? Can you talk to us about auto flowers and what you think about it? <laughs> but I've definitely been keeping, I, I have grown them and I've, I've been keeping my finger a bit on the pulse of that. Um, I think the genetics are getting better 
for sure, like way better. Um, and I think there's some really good ones out there. The main things I would say with them is they're, I think they're great for certain people. Like I, I still kind of like to grow big plants, you know, like I like to grow, real, like, you know, not as big as in California, but as big as I can get them here. But the autoflowers, like for people that are living um, in places where space is a confinement, or you just want small plants in your garden, because not everyone wants like a seven, eight, 10, 12, 14 foot plant. Like it, it's kind of hard to hide, um, but you can hide those little two, three, four foot plants fairly easily. You can camouflage them in with some other tall growing plants that you have in your garden. So I think they're good there. They're also good for people with um, shorter growing seasons. And then they're just, and they're quick to finish uh, too. You know, obviously like you can sometimes get, you could be harvesting in July or August or early September, depending when you plant them. And then I guess lastly, I'll just say on those is that um, with autoflowers, you really don't want to stress them at all. Uh, and you kind of want to get them in their, in their uh, forever home as quick as you can, that meaning like into the pod or the ground where you're going to leave them, because if they get root bound, or like not enough water, like they start to, they dry out too much, like anytime they're stressed, that, that can sometimes send them right into to flower. Uh, and transplant shot can too. So like, you, you don't really want to end up with like a, like a, but like one little three gram bud or something. Right. So I think for all those reasons, if you have good genetics, they can, they can be really good, um, to grow. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> that's it's super helpful. I mean, um, I would have never considered growing them and I live in town now and it is that thing. I you live in a very conservative area of the United States. Um, uh, we don't have, even though we're in Colorado, we don't have recreational cannabis and being in town, our, our mayor is also very conservative. She like goes around and makes sure that everything is like, you know, um, to the nines. And so growing small plants became alluring to me. I was like, I just want something small and low key that I could hide with tomatoes or sunflowers or whatever it yeah. is going on. And so this is the first time I'll be growing them. And as I was doing my research, and I'm curious as to what you think about this is people were saying, just like plug them in the ground because you don't want any of that transplant shock. Do you still think that as long as you're careful, you can do it in pots and then transplant? Or do you think putting it in the ground is like the way to go? it out what I would probably recommend is if you're new to it or if you haven't grown many of them do like half of them straight in the ground um if that's what you want to try and then do the other half like in in little like probably four inch pots or something and just get them up you know like a little bit six inches or four six eight inches and then put them in and then compare the two right but I think you'll want to make sure def like normal kind of stuff like make sure you're past your last frost date and all that kind of thing. Um, and I think that would be a good exp experiment to do. The grand auto flower experiment. It does still sound like a joke. I can't believe I'm saying it. You have learned a lot. You've been doing this for a very long time. So if you were to start all over again, you know, you were just beginning a garden for the first time, how would you do it? What would be the ways that you would go about creating your perfect garden in ways that other people can do the same? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess a lot would depend on, on environment, but whenever possible, like I think, you know, I, I'm a fan of sun growing cannabis. Like I'm a fan of growing outdoors under the sun, but you know, that's not possible for everyone. So, you know, if you live in a city or you live way far in the North or whatever, then, you know, I don't want to, I would never say don't grow indoors. Cause I think you got to do what you can with the space that you have. Um, I'm always a big fan of organic. Um, I'm not a fan of, uh, like I've used lots of bottled nutrients in my old days and in the past, but I'm, I'm a fan of like healthy, you know, what some people call living soils. It just means there's a lot of good organic matter and there's good microbes and there's good fungi in your soil. Right. Um, but, uh, I recommend like, I like having the nutrients in, in the pot, you know, so all I'm really doing is adding water, you know, so like you're mixing up soil or you have, you're, you're nurturing the soil in your garden beds um, and uh, everything's in there and then you're just adding water. It depends too, like if you're brand new, like I think the big thing is just like work with what you have and work with what you know and know that like, cause for me, like I've been at this a long time and I've been growing a lot of different plants for a lot of years. And you know, like I'm all about regenerative and closed loop farming and stuff, but that's not going to be everyone's like first step in here. Right. So like, you know, start with what you have, um, you know, take care of your plants and, and use what, what you have, right. If you can get good 
organic soil and mix all the nutrients in because there's a lot of great recipes and I think I even have some in my book so like <clears throat> do that um if all you can do is just like you know get some potting soil and stuff like that and you need to use some bottled nutrients then then use those right try to use the or organic stuff but I think like you know love your plants <laughs> take care of them um you know, figure out a system that's going to work for you. Be open-minded for that, you know, and nothing's a mistake provided that you learn from it. Learn from your stakes, take really good notes, like keep a journal. We used to, we used to burn all our notes. Like you would write stuff down and then you'd burn them because you never wanted to have any, anything like that around, right? Just start with what you have and like get, get a, a book or a guide or, you know, find someone knowledgeable and that you can ask and bounce ideas off and just learn, learn as you go and know that like, you're going to run into things, you know, you're going to run into pests and issues uh, that come up, but try to do it organically, um, have fun with it, you know, start with good genetics whenever possible is really, really important. And uh, if you're, and don't think too big, like just start small and like nurture what you have and then grow incrementally. Check them all the time, um, watch them, like really watch the nuances as they grow, look for pests and things like that, give them, give them lots of love and develop a really good relationship with this plant and treat it with the respect that she deserves. Thank you so much. All right, we have a couple of questions from in-home audience here. So Maureen and then Kirsty. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So I'm a third year beginner grow. I'm guiding five growers, all beginners. Um, and we did use auto flower for all the reasons. Um, so my challenge was finding like just really good definitive um, information from when the seed um, germinates and pops out of the soil. And we started in red solo cups. Um, like what were we were looking for. And so what happened for us is that, um, and I think this is a light issue, just needing more light. Um, once it pop, popped past those first two um, round leaves and now yeah. it is showing the serrated is what I'm getting is that that is when you are supposed to transplant either into its forever pot or into the next pot. It's her, uh, the solo cups. Do you have drainage holes in the bottom? I did. I slid yeah, it. I, I did some uh, like slit holes. Um, yeah. yeah. And so we were those. getting drainage. I and think they were just reach. They're reaching for sun. It sounds like they're reaching. Like how, what kind of light were you using and how far away was it? Oh, I'm using a um, south facing window. And the reason I'm doing that and not getting supplemental light is in order to work this process so that somebody is truly only doing soil, seed, and and you know, um, and uh, you know, hydration, water. So I'm trying to go through the process without supplemental to then kind of understand the most affordable, uh, direct way um, that somebody can yield, uh, you know, and kind of get started. So. That's why I yeah, chose no. not to supplement with lights, trying to just use the um, south facing sun window. Yeah, that that could be part of why it's stretching, I think, right there, because unless like you're getting because you're not always going to be getting beaming full sun. No, in that no. window, you know, you're going to have many days that are over. And I was even moving it, giving it it's this morning yeah. sun, moving it to the side. But, you know. <laughs> As you can do that just they're they're gonna stretch that way and that's why like having a little bit of supplemental light is a really good thing like i always recommend having having some some lights or it's full sun as you can have it um in there but you know it's just stretching it's not that like the end of the world by any any means good. yeah and, and i that's, think that thing. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's doing is stretching because it's not getting enough light um, and that's why I'll often recommend even just like those compact fluorescents or like now there's all kinds of grow lights and well, there's always been lots of grow lights, but you can buy kind of cheaper grow lights if you wanted. Is um, there any like one bulb to like put in a normal light? Do you know if that's out there? 
Yeah, there's you can find those. Yeah, if you go to like even your um, garden centers or department stores that have garden centers. And I just think that that would be an accessible, affordable way for somebody. But in terms of what your other question, like um, transplanting, like with those autoflowers or anything, you don't want to transplant too soon. Like, because if, if you tip it, like tip it over that solo cup or your pot and like give it a little squeeze and, and tap it out gently. Like you want there to be enough roots to ho that's holding all that soil. So if you're planting your seeds directly in, in a cup, like it's probably going to be three weeks, two or okay. three weeks until you should transplant. Like oh, you can really? get away with doing it earlier, but if, if the- It's only are... been a, a week and it's it's been 10 days since um, popping out of soil. Yeah, I wouldn't be too worried. Like it's not root bound by far or anything. The thing is, is if there's not enough roots and you try to transplant, a lot of that soil is gonna fall and it's gonna break off the tiny little roots that you have. Okay. All so right. it's an easy way to test it is just, you know, to kind of pull it out gently. Alexa, it's so good to see you again. I had the privilege of being at an education meeting that you were a part of. Okay. I love growing this plant. Like you said, it's a different level of connection. It truly is. I'm very fortunate. I live in beautiful Northern California, just south of the Emerald Triangle. I grow the best weed. It's Hi. my first grow year, sun grown all the way. I am so with you. And I will confess, I am planning on growing some monsters this year. My question is this, hover crops. I'm all organic. I totally agree with you. Sun grown is absolutely the best. I think it produces the best product, she says in her humble opinion. But I would love to, this is the first year that I really kind of want to experiment with cover crops. I'd love your recommendation on what you feel are some of the best cover crops to grow with cannabis. Yeah. Are you growing in the ground in or in beds or pots? I'm growing in, mo in monster uh, fabric grow bags. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So there's lots of different things like, um, in there, depending on what you want to put in, like, um, I don't always recommend clover so much anymore. Cause there, there's things that, that can come in, in on the clover. Okay. Um, let's see, what have I grown for, for cover crops? First off, like I try not to, to plant anything that's, um, uh, going to be invasive, right? Yeah. Right. That's going to be, be a big one. I would consider if you're in grow bags, like having even like um, some other plant, like medicinal herbs. Right. Mixed in. So like calendula and stuff okay. like that is a good one. Any of the aromatics. Okay. Um, or like aromatic plants, like may, mint. It's okay in the, the bags. It won't, isn't going to spread. But like um, sometimes I'll even put in like things like lemon balm and uh, yarrow. <laughs> A lot of those okay. like uh, really fragrant herbs. And I'm not thinking as much like they're not like your traditional kind of cover crop type herbs um, right. in a sense, but like rye grass and things like that, like people will, will grow more as like a straight cover crop. Okay. Um, and definitely, oh, like um, uh, maybe not as much in pots, but like uh, daikon radishes and oh, stuff wow. people will put okay. in there, like snow peas. Um, is a good mix to have in there. I know there's a list in the book of a bunch of other Terrific. ones too, though, that you Terrific. can put in. Terrific. <laughs> Alexis, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, Andrew, now, um, we probably have time for um, one more question. This is one that came in on the form before. Um, they said most people forget about harvesting, curing, trimming, burping, and storing. <laughs> Do you have any advice about this whole process? Sure. Yeah, I'll try to go through it um, in order if I can. And if I miss anything, let me know. But um, I think that's one of the, it's one of the most important things. And I think it's where most new growers go wrong um, and even, or go off, not wrong, but like just deviate from the path a little bit um, <clears throat> because, um, you know, a lot of times people will put so much time and energy into growing these beautiful plants and then all of a sudden harvest season comes along and it's just like they're chopping them down because of whatever weather or you know they're scared someone's going to come take them or whatever it happens to be right um and they're not prepared or they don't or you know the worst like <laughs> my insides always like quiver and like tighten when people are like yeah, I just like hung it in my shed, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, like maybe if you live in parts of California or like, you know, Colorado or Arizona, like wherever it's really dry, you always want to be a step ahead of yourself 
throughout the whole growing season, right? So in harvest, you need to be thinking, where am I going to dry these plants, right? Um, so that if all of a sudden bad weather comes in or frost or whatever it is in your area, you're not just like cutting them down and then like hanging them on your porch or in your back shed, right? So with drying, you, it's best if you can have a room, like a dedicated space for it indoors. Like you have to make do with what you have. But what, what you want to avoid is in your drying room or whatever, how, whatever you're drying in, you want to have your temperature as stable as you can. And you want your relative hum your humidity stable. So I always recommend 60 and 60, like 60 Fahrenheit, you know, somewhere between 16 and 18, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, or 660-ish Fahrenheit and 60% humidity, 5560. Um, and you want to avoid fluctuations, especially in humidity, because as your plants start to dry, um, they'll, they'll dry out in the day and then at nighttime it gets moist, right? It, it could rain or there's dew or whatever it is. And then the plant will act as a sponge and it'll soak that water back up, like from the air if it gets up to be 60, 70, 80, or 70, 80 degrees, uh, relative humidity, and then it dries out the next day. And that just like destroys your terpenes and it's going to make your, your weed smell like hay. Um, so you want to have stable temperature and stable humidity um, in your grow room. So 60 and 60, and you can achieve that really easily just with like a small heater if, if it's needed, depending where you live, it may or may not be needed. Um, and just like a, like maybe like a dehumidifier, um, something to keep your, um, humidity stable and then have like, a a, a thermometer hygrometer. You can get these like for 10, 20 bucks, um, with a min max setting so that you can know what's happening when you're, you're not there. Right. And, and I always try to get the drying room going for two or three days beforehand with whatever equipment, if I'm using equipment and just make sure it's staying stable and consistent. Um, and then bring, you know, the, so it's all ready when you bring your plants in. And if you're just growing small plants, like I think it's good to keep your plants as whole as you can to dry them. Like if you're just growing little two, three, four foot plants, you could almost just cut them down and, and hang them up, right? Um, before that though, when the plant's standing, I do like to take all the big fan leaves off. Um, and this is something we could never do back in the day, like gorilla growing, but now like, it's really fun on nice days to just be out there and stripping all those fan leaves off. Um, and you do that sometimes earlier to get light in and get airflow, but I'll do that when the plant's standing and then cut it down. And since I have like quite large plants and I cut them into smaller pieces, I like to have those little hooks. Um, and I like to dry them just hanging on, on strings, you know, I'll pop a, some screws into a two by four and screw it in the wall and have a whole bunch of strings. And I like to hang them upside down. Like I said, if you have smaller plants and just a few, just cut them down and hang them like that. And the reason I like that is because it, it's a slower dry. Um, cause the smaller you chop things up, the quicker it's going to dry. You see those like tiered, like hanging laundry basket things which I have some of those and I use them for like odds and ends, but I never want to cut all my flowers off the stock and dry them there because they dry too quick. Cause I always like to go for a two week dry if possible, like 10 to 14 days. If your plants are drying in under seven days, it's, it's way too fast. Uh, and that's going to affect the quality. So cut them down, um, hang them, try to get, keep your humidity and your temperature stable and, and dark and have some good airflow in the room. Like have a little oscillating fan that's just blowing like this, not directly on the flowers, but just that's moving the air around the room. Um, and that's gonna be important. If as dark as you can get it, you just, you have to work with what you have here, um, but those are gonna be important. And then that's your kind of dry, like when you're feeling the flowers after 10 days, two weeks, they should be kind of crispy on the outside. I don't do a dry trim or a wet trim though. Like I don't manicure the flowers. I just take the big ones off and anything that is suspect, if there's any kind of mold or damage, I'll cut that out. Um, but I leave all those trim like sugar leaves and a lot of the fan, smaller fan leaves on. 
And then when you hang them, those, those protect the flower. They, they come down over top of the flower. So after 10 days to two weeks, you'll feel them and they'll feel kind of crispy. And that's, and then I'll take some of those side buds and just start to like, uh, like if this is your cola um, with all the flowers, I'll just start to kind of pull them back like this. And when they start to snap, then I know they're fairly much like close to dry. And I'll feel the different size of flowers too, because the smaller ones will dry quicker. Um, but if, if they're feeling crispy and they're snapping, then that's when I cut them, take them off the lights, excuse me, and I cut them up and cut them off the stalk. And then I put them into like whatever I'm gonna cure in. Like the curing process is really, it's like a slowed down drying process. It's the second part of the drying process. And what you're doing is like, even though the flowers feel crispy, there's, there should be like moisture in the center. Like you don't want to over dry them. Like they'll still be moisture in the center. And then when you seal them up into like your <clears throat> glass jars, your big totes, your Ziploc bags, your turkey bags, your grow bags, whatever you got, <coughs> um, it cuts off that outside oxygen. So then what'll happen is the moisture from the center of the bud, let's see here, I got all these jars around me. <laughs> uh, oh, wow, this is a chocolate mimosa, I like it. <laughs> but um, then when it's in there, all the moisture from the center of the bud starts to travel to the outside. And that's when you, when you put your hand in the bag after it's been, I'm gonna try that one later. Um, <laughs> once it's been sealed for a few hours or a day or two, um, you'll put your hand in and you'll notice that it's, it's kind of moist again, right? And that's a good thing as long as it's not too moist. Um, if it's too moist, then you'll either gotta dump them out again or just keep your jar lid all off or the lid on your toad off for an hour or two and just monitor it. But what you want is you're, during the cure, you're redistributing the moisture throughout the, the flower and slowly it's drying just a little bit more. And it's kind of like, it's not fermenting, but like, it's like, it's just like, it's what's well, curing, right? Like it's kind of like a ferment, but not really. But it's it's just like curing over over time, right? And I always say there's a reason why like, and I don't smoke cigars, but um, there's a reason why Cuban cigars cost the money they do, and why um, whatever the cheap ones are, the White Owls or something, right? Like the ones with the grape filter. Why there's a reason why they're fifty cents, you know? Um, because there there there's a craftsmanship there, right? And uh, with the whole burping thing, like what you want to do is you're just feeling it and, you know, you're either opening it once a day, checking it. I find that usually after about a week when I'm not noticing a change in what um, in the like the consistency or the feel like the moisture in the in the bin or the jar, then I, I only open it every three or four days or a week. Like I like to go for like a two month cure. But I think you should at least like, I think they recommend, you know, two or three weeks minimum um, because it's going to, and that's where like your smells will come back. Cause often like you, you cut your plants down, like your plants are growing, they smell delicious. They're so beautiful and aromatic. Then, you know, you hang them in your dry room. Everything smells great. Your house stinks, whatever. Um, that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, depending. And then, you know, all of a sudden like the smells start to go away. <laughs> And then you're like, oh shit, it's starting to kind of smell like hay or something, right? But during the curing, that's when it's it starts to come come back, right? And if you miss that stage, then your 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 cannabis is just gonna smell like like um like hay or lawn lawn clippings or something, right? Another thing I should say in your drying process is that uh if if it gets too hot in your growing room i think like around 22 to 24 degrees celsius which is i, I don't know what that is in fahrenheit 80 85 maybe fahrenheit um some of those um monoterpene like they'll, they're they'll just disappear never to be smelt again <laughs> you know like they're so volatile if, if they if it heats up too much they'll just be gone <laughs> never to come back. But the curing is when like, you know, you're, it's that slowed down drying process.
it should last at least like three weeks. Once they're like the consent, the moisture isn't changing in there, um, in your bins or whatever you're using, it mostly just depends how much you have. Like if you can cure in jars, that's great. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other options. Like I cure in the big totes, you know, like just cause there's, there's so many of them and it's just the easiest to, to do. So like, that's kind of like a quick sort of walkthrough of it all. Don't, don't be too intimidated. I know it sounds a little intimidating maybe, but like, just do again, do your best and keep track of what you're doing and, and what happened and then like refer to your notes. And that's true for anything in the growing process. Thank you so much, Alexis, for coming on and sharing about your growing experience over all these years. We will link to all the places that you can find Alexis down below in the replay of this on YouTube, but you are at organagrowcanada.com. So definitely make sure that you reach out to Alexis there. Again, thank you so much. We have really appreciated it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm glad it worked out. Thanks to everyone for coming out. And I hope your plants grow really well this year or next year or whenever you you grow them. And um, yeah, I appreciate just being able to to share and talk about this beautiful plant because I uh, really do love it. It is the greatest job in the world to be able to be paid to talk and write about cannabis for sure. If you're watching this, and you love this idea of helping other people understand cannabis, make sure you check us out at the Cannabis Coaching Institute. If you want to make sure that we are the right training program for you, we do offer free calls with me, actually. So you can sign up for um, a free call on our website and you and I can determine whether the programs that we offer here might be a good fit for you. And I would love to talk to you. Um, Again, thank you so much to everyone for coming and for being here with us.